so yes, um, as you all know, I will talk about the topic of antibiotic resistance today, why it's a global threat and what can be done about it. And this is my structure. So I will start with a short introduction about the Bucopharma Campagna, the organization I'm working for. I will then zoom into the topic of antibiotic resistance and also the One Health approach. And then I will go into more detail about our project on antibiotic resistance by the Bucopharma Campagna. And yes, in the end, I hope we'll have time for a short discussion. So the Bucopharma Campagna is a German non-governmental organization working in the field of global health. And we are based in Bielefeld. So um, you can see our building there on the photo. And we were founded in 1981, which means that this year actually marks our 40th anniversary. And we also celebrated this with a conference last weekend on antibiotic resistance. Um, of course, it was also a virtual event, but uh, yeah, it was a really nice conference. And our work is based on the understanding that health is a human right. And our main objectives are a fair and equal access to medicine and also healthcare for everyone globally. And we focus a lot on original drug use. So we have a very critical look at the pharmaceutical industry and also the drug supply in the global south and the global north. But we cover various global health topics today, always depending on what projects and campaigns we're doing. And we also work a lot with partners from the global south. And our work mainly includes awareness raising. We also have a lot of educational material um, we make available. Then we also do advocacy work. So some we are based in Bielefeld, but we also have some colleagues in Berlin. And uh, we also publish the journal Pharma Brief, which appears several times a year. And uh, this is just a slide um, to show you a bit uh, what I'm talking about. So at the bottom left, for example, you see the Pharma Brief. It's the journal we publish. And um, above it is um, the Pharma Brief Spezial. It's a more extensive brochure with more information um, I have it also here. That's the one for uh, our project on antibiotic resistant resistance. Um, then there's a photo of a campaign we're doing at the moment. It call, it's called Patient Kills. Uh, we're doing this with several other NGOs worldwide. Um, then there is a screenshot of our e-learning module. So we have some e-learning courses on our website. This one is about HIV AIDS and stigma and discrimination. And you can also complete a test and th then you get a certificate for it. Of course, we also have social media. So we have a Twitter and a Facebook account. And at the moment, we're doing a lot on advocacy work on COVID-19, in particular about vaccine um, and medica medication, access to medicines. Um, and this includes a lot of media coverage. So um, that's why you see my colleague Jörg there. He's giving a lot of interviews at the moment. Uh, so that's just a really short overview about what the Buko is doing. So there's a whole range of different things. Um, and there's even more, but just to get an overview. But today I want to talk about antibiotic resistance um, and why it matters. And I will start with a short introduction into the topic in general. Um, and I want to say that the focus today and also in the project by the Buko Pharma Company is on antibiotic resistance. So not antimicrobial resistance, which also includes antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitics alongside antibiotics. But we only focus on antibiotic resistance, but um, it's very similar. So bacteria are very vital for our survival. Each one of us carries around one to two kilogram. Um, so we rely heavily on them just for our living. Uh, we need them for digestion. Um, they're responsible for our immune system, so they're not a bad thing per se. We we definitely need them for our living. Um, and then, of course, there are bacteria that can cause diseases, but even they are often harmless for us, especially if we're healthy, then it doesn't matter that we have some bad bacteria within us. Um, but of course, sometimes uh, this can lead to um, diseases and before antibiotics have been discovered, they, these infections were often deadly. So this means that antibiotics are actually very effective medicines against bacteria. So we definitely need them to treat these infections. But the problem is that the bacteria are 
quite clever so they can react to changing environments and that they can adapt accordingly and this means that resistance develops so the antibiotics stop working and of course this is a problem because uh, then the diseases could get deadly again but this process of uh, the development of resistance is actually a natural process and an evolutionary process but what we see is that it has been greatly accelerated by high level of antibiotics so resistance develops primarily there where many antibiotics are being used so for example in hospitals in factory farming or also they're also in the environment and the problem is also that the bacteria can pass on the resistance to other bacteria. So this, this speeds up the development of resistance. And also um, another major problem is that uh, the bacteria can take up several resistance genes that will then protect them against different antibiotics. And that's what we call multi-drug resistance. So that not only one antibiotic stops working, but a whole range of antibiotics won't work anymore for these bacteria. And this is also why it's becoming a global threat. So we see that bacteria are becoming increasingly resistant to antibiotics. And uh, people are also talking about the danger of a post-antibiotic age where antibiotics will just not work anymore. So infections that are treatable today may be deadly in the future again. And we see that today, already 700,000 people are dying annually due to antibiotic resistance. And according to UN estimations, this number could increase up to 10 million deaths per year by the year 2050, if no further action is being taken. And what is in particular problematic is multi-resistance, what I just uh, explained earlier, and resistance to reserve antibiotics. So reserve antibiotics are special antibiotics the WHO also lists as critically important because they are able to treat multi-drug resistance. So they should only be prescribed for very specific indications so that we keep them effective um, because the resistance here would be very harmful because they are like the last resort then we would have no other treatment options. So it's very important that we use them very sparingly so that they keep effective. But we see that in Germany, 53% of the prescribed antibiotics are these reserve antibiotics. And of course, this number is far too high if we want to prevent antibiotic resistance. Um, and also these critically important reserve antibiotics are being used in veterinary medicine, which also increases the um, spread of resistance. Um, and when we talk about antibiotic resistance, it's important that we see the interconnectedness. Uh, on the one hand, between the animal, human and environmental health sector, and that is actually what the One Health approach is about. I will talk about that in a minute. But also the global interconnectedness, because the resistant pathogens do not know borders. It's really a global concern. And I can give you an example. Um, there was in 2009 a Swedish man who returned from India and he went sick so he went to the clinic and the doctors discovered a new gene which was resistant to almost all antibiotics and just one year later it was found in 75 countries worldwide so this is why we need to tackle this together it's it's a global concern and we're all in this together so we need also to find global solutions Antibiotic resistance is also linked to poverty. So we know that poverty in general endangers health. It's a social determinant of health. There's a strong influence. Um, so we see that in other diseases um, as well. Um, and the existence of weak health systems and maybe high rate of infectious diseases or poor living conditions in countries can increase resistance rates. And that is especially a problem for countries which are already facing a high burden of tuberculosis because there is something called multi-drug tuberculosis and that's on the rise so it means that the standard treatment don't work anymore because it's a multi-drug resistance form of tuberculosis and that makes the therapy for this kind of tuberculosis much more complicated um, it's much more ex expensive it can take up to two years instead of six months and it has more side effects and the chances of cure are lower. So that means that there's 
um, something like a double burden because the countries are already having a high burden of tuberculosis and then there is this increasing danger of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Another aspect that's very important when you talk about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance is research and development. Because as I said, resistance will always develop. It's a natural process. So we definitely need new antibiotics. But at the same time, we see a lack of research and development by the pharmaceutical sector. So you might now wonder, how can that be? And the answer is quite easy because it's very expensive and very time consuming to find new antibiotics. But on the other hand, you have a very little profit. So antibiotics should be used as sparingly as possible so that resistance doesn't develop. But that is something that's not preferred by the pharmaceutical industry because they can make more money with medicine for non-communicable or chronic diseases where the people have to take the medication a lifelong. Um, and that is not the case with antibiotics, so they have a low return on investments. And also it would be very crucial that the antibiotics are affordable in the global south, but that minimizes the profits for the pharma industry even more. So they don't really have an interest in researching new antibiotics. And that's also why during the last 10 years, only eight out of 316 ingre active ingredients that have been approved for the German drug markets were antibiotics. And also we see that uh, India and China are the main hubs of antibiotic production. So there is barely any antibiotic production left in the global north. And we also see later that this has some huge environmental impact. And maybe you heard about this agreement last year by 24 pharmaceutical companies who want to invest 1 billion euro for research for new antibiotics. And of course, this sounds very good because as I said, we need research. Um, but it is very important for us that the research is publicly financed so that we really ensure an equal access for everyone globally and not a profit orientation because the antibiotics need to be affordable and accessible for everyone. So we demand that the politics create the right framework for that. And of course, we see that now with COVID-19, if there is political will, then it can lead to a very fast response. And also the, um, the investment is, sounds very promising, but they are actually planning to shift the risk to small biotech companies who shall do the research for them. And also they want to um, divide the, the money over a span of 10 years between all the companies. And then it would be about 4 million euro per company per year. And that's not really that much for the pharmaceutical industry. And just in April, there was a new report released by the WHO. And it says that there is still not enough research and development. Um, and it says that none of the 43 antibiotics that are currently in clinical development sufficiently address the problem of drug resistant in the world's most dangerous bacteria. So there are absolutely no antibiotics in the pipeline that will solve the problem anytime soon. And that most antibiotics that are in the research phase are just variations of drugs from the 1980s. So there's nothing really new, and that means that resistance will probably develop very fast. So um, this was just a really short introduction into the topic, um, but you will hear more about it. Um, but now I want to focus more on the One Health approach and why this is important and a very good concept for tackling antibiotic resistance. So the One Health approach is a multidisciplinary and holistic concept because it looks at the human health, the animal health, and the environmental health sector at the same time, and especially at the interlinkages between the three sectors. So we need close cooperation, especially on the political level, if we pursue the One Health approach. And that's actually also the concept that is followed by the WHO to tackle antibiotic resistance. And this approach is so central to fight ABR because the resistances also affect human, animal, and the environment. So we really need an interdisciplinary and global response because as I, as I said, it's one health, but it's also one world. 
And now I want to talk about the three sectors more in general and how they connect to antibiotic resistance. And I will start with the human health sector. So we see globally that antibiotics are being prescribed way too much. And the most pressing issue here is the lack of awareness that the people just don't know enough about the consequences this has um, on human health and also on the other sectors. But it's also very important that we have the data, laboratory technology, and the surveillance, because we need to have a reliable evidence base to act appropriately. So we need to know what pathogens are there and what resistance are there so that we can choose the right action. Um, so there is already the global antimicrobial resistance surveillance system, in short GLAS, by the WHO, which was set up in 2015. And it does exactly that. It, is, um, it does data collection and surveillance, and it wants to create a better evidence base. And of course, this is a very good start, but up to, the, to today, there's not sufficient data, and it's especially missing from the global south. And also, there's only the focus on the human sector so far. And of course, you need well-equipped laboratory and also the personnel to get the right data. So there still remains a lot to be done. Another problem is that we have a lot of irregular use of antibiotics, which then leads to resistance. And this includes, for example, that um, you get an antibiotic without prescription or you take an incomplete doses because you feel better at the, after the second day or maybe you have an old antibiotic at home or a friend gave you an antibiotic, so you're just using that. And this all triggers resistance rates because it's, it's irregular use of the antibiotics. And I brought you some examples from our project here. So in Tanzania, there was this problem that they had this very high rate of misuse in the pharmacies, especially in the rural areas because there were not real pharmacies, but rather little shops where the personal was allowed to sell drugs, but without any training or qualification. So there was a high rate of misuse and the government saw that. So they set up a program called EDU, which is short for accredited drug dispensing outlets. So they trained the per personnel in the shops um, about rational drug use and about when to give what medication and also antibiotics. And it really improved the situation there. Another example is um, sepsis, which is a major threat in India. So about 58,000 babies die annually due to resistant genes in India. So it's a major problem. And I will come back to this example later. But antibiotic resistance is also a particular threat to women. So we see, uh, especially in Germany, that there's a high use of antibiotics for urinary tract infections which are very common in Germany, and there are a lot of antibiotics being given. And also sexually transmitted uh, infections are getting increasingly difficult to treat. And gonorrhea is the most prominent example here. I also brought you some recommendations for action because um, it was very important for the Buku Pharma campaign that we not only show the problem, but that we also provide some solutions and some recommendations so that we show that there is something that everyone can actually do. So if you're a consumer, you should ask your doctor if you really need an antibiotic and you should communicate with him. Um, so maybe you find an alternative or um, also about the regular use of the antibiotics and just practice basic hygiene. So we're doing it a lot now because of COVID-19, but we should actually stick to it. And the same accounts for the doctor. So, of course, he should pay attention to hygiene at work and also focus on the communication with the patient to advise him, um, but also with the colleagues and to look at the current guidelines that are there for antibiotic prescription. And um, also, um, they should not pre prescribe the same antibiotic within a short period of time for the same patient. So now onto the animal health sector and antibiotic resistance. Um, we have an extensive use of antibiotics in animal husbandry. And the major problem here is intensive animal farming. And this is a major problem in Germany because we have too many animals on a small space. 
and this is just not appropriate for the animals and it's very harmful to animal welfare. So as a result, the animals get sick and then they need treatment and they get an antibiotic and this is seen as the only solution, but a more sustainable solution would be to change the living conditions in the barn so that the animal wouldn't even get sick in the first place. But this is a problem with our food industry that we demand very cheap prices and we have far too many animals and also antibiotics are very cheap. So there's really a system change necessary here because all the animals live together on a very tight space. And if one animal gets sick, they cannot be treated individually. So what happens is that all the animals in the barn are given antibiotics just for preventive reasons via the feed or the water. So all the animals are being treated. And of course, as I said, where antibiotics are being used, resistance develops. So this is a major driver of resistance. And as I said, it's a major problem in Germany. Um, and poultry are actually the animals that receive the highest amount of antibiotics. And they also get the reserve antibiotics, which are crucial for human medicine. So there was a study last year done by German Watch, a German non-governmental organization, and they investigated the three biggest poultry meat companies in Europe, and they found that on average, 51% of the samples were contaminated with resistant genes, and 35% were not susceptible to reserve antibiotics. So this is a big issue. And there are also countries where antibiotics are still used as growth promoters. So for the sole purpose of fattening the animals that they get fatter in a shorter period of time. But this is actually prohibited in the EU. And in other countries, we have the problem that there's a lack of veterinarians. We see that in South Africa and Tanzania, for example. So in Germany, we have 11,500 veterinarians. And in Tanzania, we have only 250 for the whole country. So what happens here is that the farmers can go and buy antibiotics and then use them on their own without any surveillance. And often they don't even know about the consequences this might have on human health and also the consequences this might have for themselves because farmers are a risk group because they're de dealing so much with antibiotics. So they're at, at risk of carrying resistant pathogens. Here are again some recommendations for action. So if you buy meat, then look where it comes from. If it's from a species appropriate husbandry and look if it has a qualified animal welfare seal. And as a doctor, don't give group treatments or oral antibiotics. You just dispense um, with the feed or the water and then all the animals get it. And also don't use the crucial reserve antibiotics because we highly need them in human medicine. And as a farmer, you should improve the barn hygiene or also the husbandry concept. And you should think about what can you do that will improve the animal welfare so that the animals don't even get sick in the first place. So you don't even need antibiotics. And now the last sector is the environment sector. And that is actually the, the sector we have the least data about and the least Research is being done here, especially um, in the global south. But this sector shows very well the interconnection in there is with human and animal health. Because of the antibiotic residues and resistances in the soil, in the water and in the air come from animal farming. So, for example, um, from the liquid manure, which is put on the fields, um, and then from there, it can influence human health. So there's really this interconnection between the three sectors. And we also see that waste water is a driver of resistance, especially when it's untreated. And of course, this is very problematic in poorer settings, but also if there are sewage plants, the issue is not solved because the conventional treatment technology that we mostly use is not sufficient to filter out the resistant germs or the antibiotics. So we actually need a better technology, another purification stage, but that is very expensive and it's also a problem in Germany. So um, the organization BUND took samples from freshwater in Germany 
and they also found that it's contaminated. So even here are resistant germs um, in our water. And as I said before, India is one of the main production sites of antibiotics. And this has a devastating impact on the environment there because there are very high resistance rates and also antibiotic residues in the environment where all the pharmaceutical companies produce. So that's especially a problem in the city of Hyderabad because there are a lot of pharmaceutical companies and there's this river Musi which is flowing around these companies and this, is and this river is highly contaminated. Another problem is the unfit disposal of medicine which also leads to residues in the environment. So if people just flush the antibiotics down the toilet or um, throw them away, they, they can end up in the environment and then be harmful from there on. And this is also why um, one recommendation is that you should not throw the antibiotics in the trash or flush them, flush them down the toilet, but you should take them back to the pharmacy. And if you're in Germany, you could, um, support the Lieferkettengesetz, the supply chain law, it's actually um, being discussed in the Bundestag at the moment, and it's, um, it's meant to, um, to bind companies to respect human rights and social and environmental standards. And at the moment, the industry is um, lobbying highly against it, so that the standards are not set so high, so you could demand for a stronger supply chain law here. And as a doctor, you could just reduce the consumption of antibiotics. So if you use less, then less can actually enter the environment. And it's also important that doctors and especially hospitals dispose their unused antibiotics appropriately. As a farmer, you could um, avoid the overfertilization of the soil and also the introduction of liquid manure into water bodies. Um, and then there's also this problem that heavy metals such as zinc and copper, which are sometimes used in agriculture, can actually promote resistance. Um, so you should not spread liquid manure on soil that has been treated with uh, zinc and copper in advance. Okay, so this was just a short introduction into the topic, so antibiotic resistance and how it connects to the One Health approach and where the main issues are. And now I want to focus on the project the Bukopharma Campagna did, did here. So it was mainly about recognizing global challenges and promoting local options for action. And we wanted to give an insight into the global situation of antibiotic resistance in the human, animal and environmental sector. So following the One Health approach. And we work together with partners from India, Tanzania, South Africa and Germany. Um, here are our main partners who work with us, especially on the exhibition. But we also had a lot of help from Germany. Um, we also conducted some experts meetings in advance of the project to discuss where the main problems are, what issues there are, best practice examples. So we had a lot of expertise here, a lot of organizations and um, experts that helped us. Um, and also uh, internationally, of course. So the objectives of the project are to increase the awareness and the understanding of antibiotic resistance. As I said, we wanted to pro provide a global perspective following the One Health approach and also to give solutions. And the project is targeted at students and professionals from a variety of backgrounds, but also at critical consumers. And we had several main outcomes. So the first one is an extensive brochure. It's um, this one. It's also the one uh, where you see the cover there. Um, and this it has a lot of background information about the four countries. Um, so India, Tanzania, South Africa, and Germany um, with an extensive literature review. So a lot of detailed information. And we published it in English and in German, and you can also find it on our website. So if you want uh, some further information. And then we also created a multimedia exhibition. And this was actually meant to be shown around several places in Germany. But then COVID-19 came and we could only show it at one place. So what happened is that we also decided to create a virtual exhibition. 
um, which is now being online. And core elements of the exhibition are videos um, from the four countries for each of the sector, human, animal and environment. And uh, these videos present best practice examples um, and they pr present a case study. So they are meant to be more subjective to give insight into the situation. And the brochure then is more about the background information. And also, as I said before, we had our conference last week and about antibiotic resistance. It was a two days event um, and we had a lot of interesting keynotes, workshops and also a panel discussion with politicians from Germany um, about this topic. Um, and here are also some um, impressions and we also collect a political demand and we will post them on our website and um, create a, a catalog of political demands so you can um, follow the results on our website if you want. And I also want to use this opportunity to say that in two weeks at the 20th of May, we have another webinar on antibiotic resistance and the One Health approach. So um, that is within the European Public Health Week um, and it's in the evening I, at seven o'clock and um, we invited, we're doing this together with the Bielefeld Global Health Initiative and we invited uh, three experts who will give an input, but then the focus is actually on the exchange. So we hope the, the webinar is targeted at students mainly and we want to create a room for exchange and networking so that the participants really get in touch with the speakers, but also with other students. Um, and of course, you're all invited and you will find more information on that on our website and also on our social media. Um, yes, so now I want to go a bit more into detail about the virtual exhibition. Um, this is the link here, actually, um, because I will now only show you screenshots to avoid any technical problems, but please feel free to have a look around to watch the videos you want. The exhibition is in German, but the videos are mostly in English because our partners um, did them from the English speaking countries. And I will just um, show you some screenshots here and tell you a bit about it. So um, the way it's structured is we have an introductory page where we have a trailer of the exhibition and we give an introduction into antibiotic resistance and the One Health approach. And we also present our partners. There are also two audios with interviews with our partners. And then we have the three pages, um, human, animal and environment. And I also included here that we um, at the bottom of each page, we have a banner for feedback. And if you click on there, you get uh, to a Google document with it's only four questions. It's maybe two minutes. And it would be really helpful if you have a look at the exhibition that you fill out this feedback document because it's the first time the Google Pharma company is doing an online exhibition. And it, it's just really helpful if we get some serious feedback on that. So um, it would really help us. So um, now about the human, human sector, the way it's structured is we have um, on the three pages, human, animal and environment, we have videos for each of the countries and each video is about one case study and also sometimes a best practice example. So for the human sector in India, we chose the example of antibiotic resistance and sepsis in newborns. Um, because this is a big problem um, as newborns are particularly susceptible to infections because the immune system is not yet developed. And in general, neonatal sepsis is a big problem in India and often it's triggered by bacteria which are known to have high resistance rates. So the standard antibiotics often don't work anymore. So the solution would actually be to have better diagnostic facilities and rapid tests so that you can give the right treatment in time before the baby dies. For South Africa, we have two firms in the human health sector. Um, one is about tuberculosis and antibiotic resistance, because in South Africa, there are the highest resistant rates among tuberculosis. And as I said, this makes the treatment much more complicated. And even though it is so common, it is still too often unrecognized. 
So the situation did improve, definitely, but it's still a big problem. And South Africa also has the problem that it faces this double burden. There are still a lot of people with um, HIV. And of course, that's a viral disease. Antibiotics don't work here. But if the people don't are not aware about their HIV status, they have a weaker immune system. And so they're more susceptible for bacterial infections and also for tuberculosis. And this then increases the use of antibiotics. So in the film, um, the journalist team Health E News, which worked together with us, um, in, interviewed a former MDR TB patient and also some experts from South Africa. And the second film is about antimicrobial stewardship in hospitals. It's a best practice example. So there are these committees that have been set up to ensure that antibiotics are used in accordance with the guidelines and also to provide appropriate training and exchange and interdisciplinary teams. And these teams can include pharmacists and specialists, nursing staff, and it's a very successful concept. In Tanzania, we have the problem that there's a lack of monitoring antibiotic resistance and a lack of awareness and resources such as money and personal. And I also want to stress here that it is very important that we give the right antibiotics and not stop using them at all. So I'm not saying we should not use antibiotics at all, but we should choose the right one because there's still people dying who don't have any access to antibiotics. And this is also a big problem, but it's so important that we keep them effective so that, that they are really helpful so that we, that we have a very rational use of antibiotics. And um, yes, yeah, so in Tanzania, the focus is then again about the problem of the misuse of antibiotics and the solution with the EDUs. In Germany, we address the problem of overprescription. So every fourth person receives an antibiotic at least once a year in Germany. And the overall trend is declining, but this number is of course still far too high. And in the outpatient sector, urinary tract infections are one of the most common bacterial infections. And as such, they're one of the most common reason for prescribing an antibiotic. And of course, this means that women are particularly affected here. And we also provide a prospectus example in the film for Germany. There is the project ANTIP, which is short for antibiotic therapy in Bielefeld. Um, and here doctors are working together at the local level to develop practical and widely accepted rules for prescribing antibiotics. So they're creating a uniform prescription practice to reduce the misuse. And that's also um, a very successful project. For the animal sector in India, we focused on antibiotics and poultry farming. So um, there is actually a high increase in poultry farming due to a growing domestic demand in India. But at the same time, it's, there's very weak regulation and antibiotics are also still used as growth promoters. And we have the situation here that on the one hand, the, we have this very big companies. And on the other hand, we have um, the small scale farmers who just use poultry farming as an additional income. So these farmers, they get the chicken, the feed and the medicine from the large meat producers. So they are heavily, they heavily rely on these companies and they themselves have a very little awareness about the consequences and the use of antibiotics. So there's actually a government initiative to train the farmers um, on the use of antibiotics and the consequences. And here I also want to mention that antibiotic resistance in animals is also a problem in fish. Um, so we all, we're always thinking about meat, but fish is actually also very contaminated, um, especially in aqua farming. And for India, we have the example of uh, shrimps from aqua farming. So there are these massive ponds with a lot of animals. And if, of course, if one animal is sick, you can't treat it individually. So the antibiotics are just being put into the water and all the animals can consume it. And that's also a big driver of resistance rates. In South Africa, the film is more about the One Health approach in general, and in particular about the exchange between farmers and veterinarians. And here's the problem that there are a lot of veterinary drugs available without prescription just because there are too little veterinarians. 
And also here, antibiotics are used as growth promoters, and we have massive poultry production in South Africa. But in India and South Africa, actually, the um, reserve antibiotic cholestine is prohibited, and it, this is not the case in Germany, um, and this is a big problem. Um, for Tanzania, there is the problem that we don't have many data available about the animal sector, but the studies that are there show that there is a high rate of misuse, um, and it's also used as growth promoters. And also here we have a shortage of veterinarians, so that means that we have very little control, and especially in the rural areas. In Tanzania, the poultry farming is mainly done by small-scale farmers, and only for the domestic production, but these farmers are often not aware about the consequences. Uh, and in Germany, we focus here on the example of the intensive livestock farming. As I said before, it's a major problem here in Germany because we have this massive animal farms here. And most antibiotics in the animal sector in Germany are used for poultry, and most poultry come from these li intensive livestock farming. And as I said before, this actually includes the disease of animals because they're living under so bad living conditions. And then antibiotics are seen as the only solution. So we really need a structural change here. And that's also actually something that has been emphasized in our conference that a change of the agricultural system is necessary um, to reduce the resistance rates and to keep our antibiotics effective. So we see in Germany today that we have less animal farms, but instead we have more big ones. So there are more animals on a very small space. And we also see that uh, the amount of antibiotics is actually being reduced in Germany, but we're using more reserve antibiotics. And of course, this is a very problematic trend. And as I said, cholestine is an antibiotic we definitely need in human medicine, and it's not banned in veterinary medicine. Um, so India and South Africa are actually one step ahead there of Germany. And now on to the last sector, it's the environmental sector. As I said before, we don't have a lot of data here. Um, there's still a lack of research, and that's also why we only included two videos for India and Germany here, but we included some text information and photos for the other countries. In India, we focus on the antibiotic production, and we um, used a film by the NDR about the anti production in India. And um, how and this shows how the wastewater from the production actually contaminates the waters and rivers and promotes the development of resistant germs. Um, and especially again in the city of Hyderabad, uh, which is heavily contaminated, um, especially the Musi River. And in South Africa and Tanzania, the fact that we have a lack of data and research actually shows that political action is necessary so that we create a good evidence base here because the existing studies which are there show that there are high amounts of antibiotics and residues in the environment from agriculture, from hospitals, and also from the unfit disposal of antibiotics. And also, as I said before, the wastewater treatment is crucial to remove antibiotic residues and resistant germs, but in low-income countries, only 8% of the municipal and industrial wastewater is actually being treated. And in Germany, we focus again on the contaminated water here and the study which has been done by the BUND, because the problem is that antibiotics are only partially metabolized in the body of humans and animals, so depending on the antibiotic, only 10 to 90 percent of the active ingredient is excreted again. And this, of course, then ends up in the environment. And so the film is about the um, investigations and how they found the residues and resistances in the fresh water, especially nearby animal farms and sewage treatment plants, which are close to hospitals. So this was just an yeah, a short insight into the exhibition. So, as I said, please feel free to have a look around and maybe we can also post the link of the exhibition in the chat so that you have time to watch the videos. And as I said, I would be happy to receive feedback. Um, and of course, I would also be happy if you join our webinar in two weeks. Um, yes, because here's only my literature. 
and my contact details. And yes, so I think we have time for some questions. 